like to invite you to join me as we begin this sermon with a prayer for my unbelief. Yes, you heard me right, a prayer for my, your pastor's unbelief. Will you join me in prayer? Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Amen. No, I'm not having a crisis of faith. That's not what this is about. You probably all heard about pastors who have walked away from their parishes, and then I wasn't here last week, and so maybe you were thinking that that was me, but I assure you it's not. You've all heard about pastors who have been wondering and become uncertain about the validity of the scriptures, or perhaps have come to the frightful understanding that God did not exist. And so they're just pastors going through the motions. I assure you that is not me. I'm not having that kind of crisis of faith. Thank God that by the Spirit of God, my faith is as strong as it's ever been. And yet, I tell you, I need to pray that prayer. And I need to pray it often. And I expect that by the end of this sermon, you would say the same. Now, all of us in here, I imagine we consider ourselves to be believers. But perhaps there's somebody here among us who is daring to stay here in their unbelief. You've come because you're here just to support a family member or a friend, and yet you don't really buy any of it. Well, if that's you, if that describes you, please don't let my calling you out at this moment cause you not to want to come again. Please, come join us. I'm glad you're here. See, because I believe that when you're gathered together among the people of God, in whom the Spirit of God dwells, hearing the Word of God, through which the Spirit of God speaks, you can't help but have the Spirit of God working on your heart, too. So by all means, stay and worship with us. Challenge accepted. Try to remain here in your unbelief, but also know this, that if that describes you, you're not alone in your unbelief. Because the rest of us who are gathered here, who consider ourselves believers, live with latent unbelief in our life, too. That's because belief is not just the acknowledgement that God exists. Belief is more than that. Last week, Pastor Ed Schultz was here with you, and he was preaching to you from our New Testament letter lesson, which was from the Epistle of James. It was the second chapter. He talked to you about not letting our partiality show. I really appreciate his being with you, sharing God's word with you. And then this week, our epistle lesson from the letter of James picks up where that left off, but it actually starts in chapter 3. You might have noticed that. And so there are a few verses that were skipped in the middle. And among those verses skipped was right after the lesson last week ended at chapter 2, verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 19 of James says this. You believe that God is one? You do well. James is referring to the Old Testament confession of faith, that great confession of faith found in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. James 2.19 says, if you believe this, that the Lord your God is one, you do well. Except he's not so much giving a compliment there as a patronizing critique because he goes on in the rest of that verse, James 2.19, to say, even the demons believe this and shudder. See, in James chapter 2, James is alerting us to the fact that faith is not just the acknowledgement that God exists, or even the acknowledgement of who the true God is, but faith is something that transforms our hearts and lives so that when we have faith, good works actually flow from it. And if they don't, James in chapter 2 says that we don't really have a live and living faith that we think we have, because faith without works is dead. James 2, 26. And that kind of rounds out chapter 2. Today's lesson picked up at chapter 3 with just one instance of this in one facet of our life, and that's the facet of our speech and the things that we say. When we have faith in our hearts, it will exert its influence over even what comes out of our mouth. So out of this mouth will not come both curses and blessings. But instead, like a horse, with, that's been fit with a bit in its mouth. Faith reigns in our tongues so that we speak only the things that the Spirit of God gives us. And the fruits of the Spirit are things that are loving. So we'll speak loving things and joyful things and peaceful things. 
and kind things and patient things and gentle things. When our tongue is being controlled by the faith in our hearts, well, there will be a remarkable amount of self-control over what we say. But even as I talk to you about that, just that one simple facet of our lives, maybe you're thinking in your mind about those thoughtless things that came out of your mouth last week that probably shouldn't have been said. And, and already in this one little facet of our life, we start to recognize that this late unbelief in our life is exerting its influence. And even as I talk to you about that, maybe you're thinking, well, what did pastor say last week that he needed to start with that prayer? Lord, help my unbelief. Although you probably know already where I got that prayer. That prayer comes from our gospel lesson. Because there was a man in Mark 9 who prayed that prayer. And it makes it very apt for us today, too, because this man recognized the latent unbelief that was in his life and turned to the only one who could fill him with faith, turned to Jesus. The disciples in that gospel lesson, Mark chapter 9, are also filled with a latent unbelief, but they don't even recognize it. They don't know it. And we can actually identify with both of them, with the man and with the disciples. And that's why we're going to spend our time today in that gospel lesson, Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. Do you have it in your service folder on page 4? I invite you to open it up and follow along. Or better yet, have your Bible with you? Open your Bible to Mark chapter 9, verse 14. We'll start there. Join me with me at the place where all the crowds are gathering around the disciples because they're in an argument with the scribes and, and a controversy is building. And then Jesus enters into the scene. That's verse 14. Verse 15, Jesus comes and all attention for a moment is turned to him and it quells the controversy. But Jesus recognizes this is a teachable moment. So before it passes, verse 16, Jesus asks the disciples and the crowd, what is it you are arguing about with them? And then there's a man from the crowd who responds. And he says, teacher, I'll fill you in. And he fills Jesus in, I have brought to you my son because he has a spirit that makes him mute. And when it seizes him, it throws him to the ground, and he foams, and he grinds his teeth, and he becomes rigid. And I brought him to your disciples so that they might cast the demon out, but they were not able, says the man. That's verses 17 and 18. And then Jesus replies to them, and he says in verse 19, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And we say, wow, that's pretty harsh from Jesus. Oh, faithless generation. I mean, it seems like they're all acting in faith. I mean, the man brought his son to Jesus to heal him. But Jesus sees beneath the surface. He sees the late unbelief that hasn't yet become apparent in the text yet to us. But one more well-placed question to this man will draw it out. But Jesus starts by asking him to bring the boy near now, this has often been called, in the Gospel of Mark, the healing of the boy with epilepsy. Because the description of the symptoms that he goes through when this seizes him sound a lot like an epileptic seizure. But let me assure you, there's more here going on than just epilepsy. Because there's a demon involved, an unclean spirit. And James 2, verse 19, said that the demons know who the true Lord is. They know it. And they shudder. And so as soon as this boy is brought near to Jesus, well, immediately it began to convulse him. And he fell on the ground and he began rolling around. Because this demon knew who the Lord was. And in Jesus, he saw the Lord. God of God, I am like, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made who for some reason that this spirit did not know, came down out of heaven and was incarnate into our flesh and became man. And because of the shock of that and the surprise of that, the, the demon threw this boy into convulsions. And so the text says that immediately it convulsed him and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And his father said, from childhood. And it often throws him into the water, or into the fire to destroy him. And the man said to Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion 
And here, actually, see, we see the first signs of that late unbelief, the first apparent marks that we can see. It's in his words. It's the word, if. If you can. See, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the certainty of what we do not see, says Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. If a person has faith, you can say to this mountain, be picked up and deposited into the sea, and it will do so. Jesus is going to go on to say to his disciples of chapter 11, verse 23, even things that are impossible with man are not impossible with God, for all things are possible with God. Jesus is going to remind his disciples in the very next chapter, chapter 10, verse 27, even though the disciples should have already understood that from this episode, that if is not a part of faith. Ifs have to do with our humanity. Ifs have to do with our limited ability. Ifs have to do with our inability to control our circumstances. And none of those ifs apply to God. And so Jesus replies to the man when he says, If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus replied to him, Take a look. That is to say to him, if you can, verse 23, and notice there's an explanation point on the end of that added by the editors of the English translation so that you don't miss Jesus' emphasis. If you can, all things are possible for him who believes. Why is it that all things are possible for him who believes? Is it because by believing in Jesus, we're given some kind of power that we didn't have before? Is it because when we have faith in Jesus, it transfers God's ability to us? No, it's not for any of those reasons. It's because faith looks to the one who has the ability to do all things. Faith believes and trusts in what he says and expects him to do what he promises to do. Faith is living in expectation, and when that expectation is not going to be fulfilled for some time, the scriptures call it hope. And they say that that hope does not disappoint us. And why is that? Well, we'll finish Paul's statement from Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts through his spirit whom he has given us. And so faith trusts in the one who produces hope, in the one who creates faith itself. Faith looks to him, and that's what the man in this text does. The man turns to God, who is standing before him in the person of Jesus, and asks for faith. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And God does what he asks for. Jesus fills him with faith and also heals his son. And so Jesus speaks to that unclean spirit, you deaf and mute spirit. Leave the boy and never return and after he cried out loud and it convulsed him terribly, and the unclean spirit left, and so that the boy was left on the ground and looked like a corpse, and the people said that he had died, but Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up. Now you remember earlier in this episode, the father had told Jesus that first I brought him to your disciples so that they could cast it out, but they were not able. Jesus had given the disciples the ability and authority to cast out demons. Already back in Mark chapter 6, verse 7, he was sending these same disciples out, two by two, to the different villages in Israel, sending them out to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, and chapter 6, verse 7 says he gave them, quote, authority over the unclean spirits. And ever since Mark chapter 6, they have been casting out demons, except this time. And it's bothersome to them. And so after this whole situation is over and the crowd is dispersed and they went back into the house privately with Jesus, they asked him, why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus replied to them, this is the last verse of our text, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Now we'd like to ask a follow-up question. What kind are you talking about, Jesus? This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. What kind? Are you talking about the kind that mimics the symptoms of epileptic seizures? That kind? 
Are you, are you talking about the kind that tries to kill young boys by throwing them in the water or the fire? Are you talking about that kind? What kind are you talking about, Jesus? Except that the disciples asked that question. Mark doesn't report it for us because that question actually leads us down the wrong path. Sam convinced that when Jesus said this kind, he's not just talking about a certain kind of unclean spirit or a certain kind of demon. He's talking about any kind of issue that we might deal with, that we need to deal with, with a power that's not our own. Let me say that again. When Jesus said this kind, he's not talking about just an unclean spirit, but anything that we face in life that we need to deal with using a power that's not our own. It needs to be dealt with with prayer. You see, because the disciples are now under this false assumption that because they've been able to cast out demons in the past, that somehow Jesus has given that ability to them and it actually belongs to them, that they don't need him to do it and they don't need prayer to do it. They don't need to rely on him, but instead they can just do it in and of themselves. But remember, faith is not the acknowledgement that God exists. Faith is the reliance upon the Lord and the trust in Him and His promises and for Him to do what is not possible for us to do. And so when the disciples assume that they have the power to do this on their own, they're making an assumption that not even Jesus, when He came in our humanity, made. You see, because Jesus, after He sent the disciples out on their two-by-two -two mission, when they gathered back to him after all they had done and crowds gathered, even before he broke the five loaves and the two fish and shared it with the crowds, he prayed to the Father before he did it. And then at the end of that episode in Mark 6, Jesus left the crowds and went up on the mountaintop to pray. Well, and then Jesus, later in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, when he's about ready to come to the culmination of his life's work and the whole reason that he came from heaven here that the evil spirit didn't know about in order that he might be betrayed and arrested and crucified and raised from the dead, before he entered into all that, he spent hours on the Mount of Olives praying. And then when Jesus was on the cross, Mark chapter 15, verse 34, just about to give up his life, there was a prayer on his lips, the prayer of David from Psalm 22. He's praying to the Father. Now, to my knowledge, in Mark's gospel, Jesus never explains his prayer life. But he does so in the gospel of John. John chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, Jesus said this, The Son cannot do anything of his own accord, but can only do what he sees his Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. And the Father has shown all things to the Son because the Father loves the Son. And he will do greater things than these so that you may rejoice. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so he has given the Son authority to give life to whom he wills. That's John chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. I think that's what's going on here in Mark chapter 9. Actually, I'm convinced of it. Jesus is not doing this, casting out this demon on his own. But he's doing it in communication and cooperation with the Father and with the Spirit. So that together the Father, the Spirit, and Jesus are casting out this demon. And not only that, but has authority to do more than that. So when this boy is like a corpse on the ground and the people think he's dead, well, you know what, he might as well be dead. Because in oneness with the Father and the Spirit, Jesus can even raise the dead. Jesus didn't do anything without their communication and oneness with his Father through the Spirit. And he does so for you and me. Jesus can even raise the dead, can give life, because the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, have done what humanity could not do. And separated our sin from us, and defeated our death for us, and now gives us the promise of eternal life. And that's what the rest of that John passage is about. John chapter 5, verse 24. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has already passed from death into life. This is the promise of our God. And to believe that promise is not just to acknowledge that Jesus exists or that he's God but it's to rely upon that promise that Jesus is the one who gives us life and to put our faith and trust in it, expecting it to be true. That's what it's like to live in faith. And that's the faith the Lord gives us.
But we also have hanging around that latent unbelief. That latent unbelief that causes us, like the disciples, to kind of be trying to now do this on our own. So anytime we start a task that would be better done with the Lord, and instead try to do it of our own power, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Or maybe we do pray, but our prayers are filled with ifs. If you can. Not expecting the Lord to come through on his promise, but, but wondering if he will. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Because if has no place in our prayer life. Not applied to God. Now there are times when there will be an if in our prayer, and actually the epistle of James goes on to talk about that in the very next chapter after the one that was in our lesson for today. It's James chapter 4, verse 15. James says there are times when we need to pray if it is your will. But notice when we say if it is your will, it's not an if applied to God. It's, it's an if applied to our ability to discern and know God's will. Because there are certain things in Scripture that God has told us for sure and certain. And, and of that, there is clarity. There is no doubt. There is no if. Things like this. How do you know that God loves you? Does he? The answer is yes. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. If you want to look it up, says it very clearly. Because Jesus gave his life for us. Well, how do I know that I'm chosen? Am I? The answer is yes. The scriptures say it very clearly. First, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Even before the foundation of the world, God chose you. Well, do I know that in Jesus I have eternal life? The answer is yes. I just described that to you from John chapter 5, verse 24. But James 4.15 is talking about things that God has not specifically said in his word, like, should we go to this city or that city? We do business here or there? On these types of things, we pray to the Lord with a prayer, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. And that's not a prayer of unbelief. That's actually a prayer of faith. It's a prayer of faith that God is going to do what he wills to do, and it's a prayer of submission and willingness to comply with his will, whatever that is. That's faith. What's not faith is what I did when I went to this city or that. So a couple weeks ago, I went to that city, Portland. And after I was there for some meetings, I was traveling back on the plane, and I was sitting next to a gentleman who really needed to talk. He had been on a business trip to somewhere in the Southwest, and this was the last leg of his journey home. But the night before, his wife had been in the emergency room. She's been struggling with cancer for quite some time. And her latest episode had landed her in the hospital again, and he was out of town. So he was very anxious and eager to get home and see her and see how she was. And I could tell that talking about it lowered his anxiety, and so he talked, and I let him talk the whole way from Portland to Spokane. And I listened. That there was a time in there also where I got a chance to share with him and encourage him to Jesus. His was not a church-going family. And I got a chance to encourage him to believe in Jesus and put his trust and faith in Christ Jesus and that his wife being healed or not healed was not going to have anything to do with how good a person she was or how good a person he was because that's kind of the track he was running down. But instead, he could trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus because this is where we see how much God loves each one of us how much he loves you. And so I invited him to just have faith in Jesus. I told him I would pray for him. Although in that moment, I didn't pray with him there in the plan because I had the sense that in that confined area, he was going to feel very uncomfortable if I prayed for him. So I told him I would, and I also had the chance to invite him to Holy Cross, I invite him to come to worship. And, and as it turns out, he actually lives right over there along Friendship Park. He's close enough that he and his family could walk here to worship. Isn't that an amazing story? But I haven't told you yet, and maybe you're wondering, so where is the unbelief in the story? Where is pastor's lack of faith? Right, so far, it sounds like a person who came to the disciples because his loved one was dealing with a demon. And cancer is a demon, even if it's not a spiritual kind. It is of the kind that cannot be dealt with except by prayer, because it's certainly beyond our own abilities to deal with it. But I didn't pray with him in the moment. And even though I have since prayed for him, 
even in the moment when I was sharing with him about Jesus and inviting him to believe in Jesus, I didn't have any expectations that it would happen. I didn't expect that I would see him again. Either that he would actually believe in Jesus or that he would actually come to the Holy Cross. And if you are here today, my apologies for not asking your permission to share this with everyone and also my apologies for my lack of faith because obviously God has been at work in your life if he's brought you here. But then last week, as a Trinity Lutheran Church in Greensville, Idaho, I was coming back from working with the board of directors at Camp Perkins and on my way back, I had made my way back early enough so that I could uh, stop in and worship at Trinity Grangeville which is a congregation of about 35 people in a very small little building so that it actually felt like a full church building with just 35 people. And it was wonderful to worship with them. And Pastor Mike Musigates, who's the pastor there, was preaching on the gospel lesson for last week, which was from Mark chapter 7. And in that chapter, Jesus healed a man who was mute and was deaf. And Pastor Musigates connected the word that God had spoke at creation through which all creation sprung into existence, with the word that became flesh in Jesus and walked the earth for us, with the word that Jesus spoke to that deaf man so that his tongue was loosed and his ear could hear, with the word that we speak to other people when we invite them to believe in Jesus. And he said it's all the same word. And it is a powerful word. And it's a word that creates what it says because God is the one giving it. And as I listened to him, I recognized my unbelief. My unbelief. That even as I was sharing and inviting this person to believe in Jesus, I had no expectation that it would actually happen. That God would actually create the faith that I was inviting him to have. That's what God invites us to do. To believe it. And, and, and even as I did that, I begin to recognize now my unbelief. And so maybe by this point you're recognizing your need for this prayer also. A prayer to the only one who can truly create faith and give us that expectant sort of life, that trust in him to follow through on what he promises and to transform our heart and life to match. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. So if you're convinced that you need that prayer as much as I do, let's just close the sermon with that today. Just say it with me. Lord, I believe. Lord, I Help. Lord, I believe. Help. I believe. Help. I believe.